Hello and welcome back to Global Value. In today's video, we're performing a fundamental stock analysis of Becton Dickinson and company, ticker symbol BDX. We're looking at Becton Dickinson today because they recently hit their 52-week low and because they are a dividend king. They're a member of the S&P 500 who has consecutively increased their dividend payments for each of the past 50 years. This puts them in a very select group for their historical track record with companies such as Coca-Cola, Procter & Gamble, and Johnson & Johnson. Even though Becton Dickinson might not be as well known as some of those other companies, they've still got the same track record to be right up there with them. So currently, they're trading for $223.60 per share. Over the past year, their stock price is down 9.5%. Going back five years, their stock price has only compounded at a rate of a little under 1.5% annually. Over 10 years, things are looking much better. They're compounding at a rate of 11.5% annually. And going back prior to the global financial crisis, over the past 18 years, Becton Dickinson has returned about 8.5% compounded annually. Keep in mind that that is not including their dividend payments. Currently, they're paying out about a 1.5% dividend yield, which is a little bit under what an S&P 500 ETF would be paying out right now. So Becton Dickinson is about $7 over their 52-week low. They're down more than $60 from their 52-week high. They are a very large business. They have a $64 billion market cap. For more background about the company, Becton Dickinson is the world's largest manufacturer and distributor of medical surgical products, such as needles, syringes, and sharps disposal units. The company also manufactures diagnostic instruments and reagents, as well as flow cytometry and cell imaging systems. BD Interventional, largely the former Bard business, accounts for 23% of their revenue, and international revenues account for 44% of the company's business. Becton Dickinson was founded in 1897 and is based in Franklin Lakes, New Jersey. So for our fundamental analysis today, we are performing the Select 6 analysis, taking a checklist-style approach of six standard financial metrics to come to a holistic and beginning understanding of Becton Dickinson based off of their business fundamentals. So this analysis is still a work in progress and it's an opportunity to learn in public. It's going to continue to evolve and improve over time. So with that said, let's get right into today's analysis. So starting off with metric number one, we want their average return on capital over the last five years to be above 14%. So over the long run, over the course of decades, a stock is going to return approximately what its underlying business returns, and these underlying business returns are going to be captured here by return on capital. So Becton Dickinson earns just about average returns on capital. The average publicly listed business earns about 7% return on capital, and over this time frame, Becton Dickinson is averaging about 6.3% returns on capital. So well below that 14% mark we're looking for, and even just slightly below average. So this is going to be an X to start off on metric number one. Metric number two, we're taking a high-level overview of the cash coming into the business. We want to see their revenues, earnings, and free cash flows growing over the last five years. So this metric is all or nothing in nature. Either all three of these are going to be up for a check, or if even one of them is down, this entire metric will be an X. So over this time, they've grown their revenues quite significantly, almost doubling revenues. They've also almost doubled their net incomes. And from fiscal 2017 to fiscal 2021, it would look like they almost doubled their free cash flows as well. However, their last 12 months of free cash flows are actually down from where they were in 2017. So from fiscal 2017 until today, their cash flows are actually down. And so unfortunately, this is going to be another X here on metric number two. Next up for metric number three, here we're taking the perspective of an individual shareholder in the business and looking at Becton Dickinson on a per share basis. We're looking for earnings per share growth over the last five years. So over this time, their earnings are up and their earnings per share are up. So this is going to be a check on metric number three. However, their earnings per share are up at a rate that's slower than their earnings have grown, and this is because the company has diluted existing shareholders by nearly 28% over this time, so they've issued additional shares. A lot of these shares were issued between 2017 and 2018, however, they have continued issuing shares even in the years after that, and so this is less than ideal. It potentially came on the back of some acquisition that the company made. And if that's the case, you would want to understand if that acquisition was value additive for existing shareholders. Typically, we don't like it when companies dilute existing shareholders by issuing new shares. Because when you purchase a share of stock, what you're really buying is a fractional ownership percentage in that underlying business. And when a business issues new shares and dilutes existing shareholders, they're decreasing your ownership percentage in the company. So that means that they're ultimately decreasing the percentage of the business's profits that you're entitled to. So even though Becton Dickinson's profits have grown over this time, as a long-term shareholder in the business, your percentage of those profits would have decreased. So because of that, that's why it's really important to make sure that a company is truly getting a ton of value if they're paying for an acquisition in 
shares. Some of the worst mistakes that Warren Buffett has ever made at Berkshire Hathaway have come from when he purchased businesses using Berkshire Hathaway's own shares. Such was the case in the early 90s when he purchased a couple of different shoe companies, including Dexter Shoe, and he paid in part for those acquisitions using shares. Those companies ultimately pretty much went to zero, and every year that Berkshire continues compounding, the price of that acquisition just keeps getting more and more expensive. So it's really important that management is long-term oriented and prudent when issuing new shares, and so you would just want to do additional research into why they were issuing new shares over this time. Either way, this is our first check here on metric number three. Metric number four is going to be very similar. Here we're looking for free cash flow per share growth over the last five years. Over these fiscal years, their cash flows have increased. However, over the last 12 months, their free cash flows per share are less than half of where they were at in 2017. So this is because their free cash flows are down over this time and because they've diluted existing shareholders. So this is going to be yet another X on metric number four. And so far through our first four metrics, we only have one check and three Xs. Next up for metric number five, we're evaluating how the company utilizes leverage. So we want their net debt, which is long and short-term liabilities minus cash and short-term investments, to be below the amount of free cash flow that they produced over the past five years. So at the end of their last fiscal year, Becton Dickinson had about $16 billion in net debt. Currently, they've decreased this amount and they have about $13.8 billion in net debt. A lot of this debt was added again in 2018, likely coming from the same acquisition that they issued all of those shares. And so with nearly $14 billion in debt here, we'd want to make sure that this is well supported by their cash flows. However, when we add up their total amount of free cash flow over the last five years, they've only produced about $12.3 billion in free cash flow. So that's about $1.5 billion off of the net debt that they currently have. So this is going to be an X here on metric number five. This is especially concerning because their cash flows have declined so much over their last 12 months. They've only produced $1.5 billion in cash flow over their last 12 months. You would ultimately want to see how this debt is structured and when it reaches maturity to be able to have a better perspective of if this is going to negatively impact the company or not in the future. So another X here on metric number five, they're utilizing a little too much leverage in their business relative to their free cash flows than what we would ideally want to see. For our sixth and final metric, the big metric of them all, we want their average free cash flow to their total enterprise value to give us a yield above 5%. If this is the case, this will give us a slight risk premium to the risk-free treasury, which is currently yielding about 4% and give us a reason to potentially be interested in the company. We're using their total enterprise value because this is gonna give us a more realistic economic picture of the business than their market cap will alone. By taking into account both their market cap and their net debt position, to look at the business more similarly to as if it were a private company. So currently, Becton Dickinson has a $77.5 billion total enterprise value, and we learned that in the last five years, they produced $12.3 billion of free cash flow, which means that in an average year, they're producing about $2.5 billion of free cash flow. So when we divide their $2.5 billion of free cash flow by their $77.5 billion total enterprise value, that is only going to give us an average free cash flow to enterprise value yield of about 3.2%. So that's both below that 5% mark we're looking for and below the rate of the 10-year treasury currently. So this is going to be an X on metric number six. Also worth pointing out is that they've only produced one and a half billion dollars over their last 12 months of free cash flow. So to get a current free cash flow to enterprise value yield, when we divide their one and a half billion dollars of their last 12 months of free cash flow by their 77 and a half billion dollars total enterprise value, that only gives us a current free cash flow to enterprise value yield of 1.9%. So that's even worse than where they've been at historically. It looks like the business compared to their abilities to produce free cash flows is being richly valued here. However, this is just a starting point and this is just one out of six data points here to look at. So it's ultimately up to you to do more work to learn about the business, whether this is the case or not. Then as mentioned, Becton Dickinson is a dividend king. They've steadily increased their dividend payments for each of the past 50 years. So here we're looking at their dividend profile over the past five years. Even with a very strong dividend track record, People make mistakes all the time by blindly chasing dividends, so it's important to look at a company's fundamentals and to determine if a dividend is well supported by that company's abilities to produce free cash flows. For Becton Dickinson, in all five of these years, they've increased their dividends per share, and they've had plenty of cash flows coming in to be able to healthily support their dividends. Even with their cash flows per share falling in half from where they were in 2017, they're still producing more than enough cash flow to be able to comfortably support dividend increases now and into the future. So as long as their cash flow doesn't continue to fall, and even though this is based off of past performance, and this isn't necessarily what's going to happen in the future, it looks like that would be highly unlikely given the nature of this business. And so it does seem likely that they'll be able to increase their dividends going forward.
Then finally, here using a discounted cash flow model to come to a potential fair value for Becton Dickinson, starting with an average of their free cash flows over the last five years, and then using growth and terminal stages based off of their historical abilities to grow their free cash flows. We're using historical growth assumptions that you need to check that they're accurate and confirm that they would be applicable for Becton Dickinson potentially going forward into the future. And we're using them in order to give us a reasonable estimate of what a potential baseline for the company could be. So dating back all the way to 1990, Becton Dickinson has been able to grow their free cash flows at a rate of just over 8% annually. So projecting a growth stage over the next 10 years where they keep that up, and then a terminal stage over the next 10 years out after that, where that growth rate falls in half to only 4% starting with their average free cash flows. If we were looking for a rate of return of 10% over the next 20 years, then it looks like a potential fair value for the business would be about $135 per share. So down quite a bit from where they are today. Keep in mind that these are just assumptions. This is just a starting point. And ultimately to get a more nuanced and more in-depth perspective here, you just would need to do deeper work on the business. Using these same assumptions, from today's prices, it looks like you could reasonably expect about a 4.5% rate of return going forward from Becton Dickinson today. Keep in mind that this would be including their dividends, which currently they have about a 1.5% dividend yield. So it looks like their stock price would only be compounding at a rate of about 3% from here on out if these assumptions are accurate and applicable for the business going forward. Also, please be aware that this is not financial advice. This is not a buy or sell recommendation of any security. And before considering any potential investment decision, please consult with the properly licensed and registered financial and legal professionals. Any potential investment comes with the risk of losing money permanently. And so this is not an investment recommendation. So in summary, Becton Dickinson only checks the box on one out of six of our metrics. They're earning below average returns on capital. While their revenues and their earnings are up over this time, their free cash flows are down over the last five years till currently. They've also diluted shareholders by 28% from a major acquisition that they made in 2018. And they added on quite a bit of debt over that time with their high debt load still from that acquisition more than four years ago and their decline in free cash flows over the last year. The business does look like it's utilizing more leverage than we're necessarily comfortable with. Again, you'd want to understand how that debt is structured and when it matures to get a better sense of if that's going to negatively impact the business going forward. And then based off of the yield for both their average free cash flows and their current free cash flows to their enterprise value, it does not look like there's a lot of margin of safety in the current price of this business. Although looking at their dividend profile, it does look like the business is producing enough cash flows to sustainably and steadily increase their dividends going forward into the future. And finally, performing a discounted cash flow analysis of Becton Dickinson based off of their historical growth assumptions and their average free cash flows over the last five years, you could reasonably expect about a 4.5% rate of return going forward from the business over the next 20 years if those growth assumptions are accurate and applicable for the business going forward. That's something that you're going to want to learn more about in more depth and just do your own homework here to really be diligent about the business. It's worth reiterating that this is not financial advice. This is not a buy or sell recommendation of any security. Instead, this type of analysis serves as a beginning and holistic understanding to help you determine whether it's worth your time and energy to dig in and learn more about Becton Dickinson. So if you're interested in learning more about the company, I would guide you to start with the company's filings. You can read through their 10Ks to get a sense of the history and the operating results of the company. Management will also detail some of the risks that the company faces in those 10Ks and you'll get a deeper understanding of both the environment and the operating strategy that the company is using, as well as learning more about both the competence and the character of management, and understanding how those incentives for management are either aligned or not aligned for the business. When you're done reading through their 10Ks, I would also recommend reading through their 10Qs, as well as reading through some of their recent quarterly earnings call transcripts to get a perspective of the business on a quarter to quarter basis. So as you're conducting this deeper research as a value investor, you're ultimately trying to understand the business as if you're gonna own 100% of it, and you can truly understand the essence of the business and know what's important and what's not important for the company. Through this deeper research, you'll be able to learn both qualitative and quantitative aspects about Becton Dickinson that will help you to determine for yourself what you think an appropriate intrinsic value for the company should be. So with that said, that's it for today's fundamental stock analysis of Becton Dickinson and Company, ticker symbol BDX. If you enjoyed today's video, please be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel for more stock analysis videos, and comment down below what business you want me to take a look at next time. Thanks for learning about Becton Dickinson with me, and have a great day.